trouble with heritage is the fact that the past is My name is Jeff Sparrow. I'll be facilitating tonight. On behalf of the Eureka Centre, I'd like to acknowledge the Kadarani people, the traditional owners of the land on Pay my respects to their elders past and present. To any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the audience or watching. Also, I'd like to pay my respects to all of you people for coming out on such a cold, <laughs> cold night to this discussion. I'm sure it's going to be fascinating. Okay, well, as I said, my name is Jeff Sparrow. I am a writer, master, and um, <laughs> academic. <laughs> Uh, the question of heritage is something that has been important to me for a long time. Many years ago, I wrote a book called Radical Melbourne. A look at the place and communities in Melbourne that had an association with the radical past intended to encourage people to engage in um, activism for better. Since then, however, been very conflicted about precisely what I think about the very question that we need to relationship between heritage on the one hand and social on the other. And I like to think about it as arguments between the two groups. What I mean by that is one of the people very has been very important to me, me and the way that I think about heritage great 19th century Morris. Know him as a designer, many people have got sheets with Jim Morris designs on them, but he was also a, a poet, architect, and one of the things that's really interesting about William Morris, being a political activist, precisely around this already very successful artist designer when he founded the party. And in the course of protecting English heritage, he became more and more convinced he was a radical socialist. So that's one of the reasons. Sometimes, however, I think that the trouble with heritage that encourages not so much historical betting. What I mean by that is historians try to encourage us to think about the difference between the past, to think about different ways that people in the past lived, acted, and Sometimes it seems to me that what heritage does is allies that against the past simply the same as the present, except that it's being strange and unusual. You want to think about it like that? The other William Perry, about another 19th century, slightly Blake, and particularly the William Blake of um, uh, Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And the line that always comes to my mind is Blake's injunction to drive your cart, your plow over the bones of by that, it means sometimes it's necessary to radically break to imagine it, completely young what's before us, completely different way of. All right, so how can we resolve this dispute between Williams? Unfortunately, Morris, Blake, Dead, so we can't invite them here tonight. <laughs> but we do have three very um, distinguished guests on this panel. Just um, before you tonight. So let me introduce all three of them to you now, and then we'll get underway. We'll have about um, forty-five minutes of discussion here for the front, and then there'll be plenty of discussions. Our three guests are 
uh, from left to right, Adam McGuinness, who has worked as a stonemason and a bricklayer before transitioning to become a ranger and archaeologist for Parks Victoria and a heritage officer for Mornington Peninsula Shire. He now facilitates Captify, where he consults in education, archaeological assessments and artists. He is a board member for, of Working Heritage Incorporated, an organisation which develops strategies for managing historic, historic buildings and properties. He studies archaeology and specialises in colonial Greek architecture, Victorian coastal architecture, archaeology, and he is a practising artist and lives in Mornington and is a Bunurong First Nations owner. Our second panellist, Erin McCuskey, is a cinematic artist, writer and photographer. Work falls between the borders of art and cinema. Her current work is the, the story world Luxville, the tale of an artist revolution that challenges the city to take the risk of living up to its promise. Luxville is about remembering where. And our third panellist, Janice Dewey, received her PhD in social anthropology following field work in Papua New Guinea. Since then, she has pursued a number of research areas, including local Indigenous history, the sociology of permanent residents, and caravans. The theme in her work is the place of indigeneity, environment, and history in Polynesia. Please join me to make you all three of our panelists feel very well. <laughs> all right, now I'll sit down so we can be less formal. <clears throat> so the dictionary defines heritage as something from the past that continues to impinge on the present. It's easy then to think of heritage as a feature that prevents a place or a building from modernizing, something from the past that extends into the future and prevents us from moving. Are there, however, other ways to conceptualize heritage, ways that might be more associated with progress, indeed with change? And I might direct that to you, Adam, given your association with Working Heritage, an organization that grapples with these very questions. How do you conceive? Uh, thank you. Uh, knowledge you're on Wadarong country and knowledge your ancestors uh, on country, I think. Uh, great question. Uh, it's an intro. Um, so, heritage is subjective. Like, so, so, you ask everyone what heritage is in its definition, probably come up with an ideal, sometimes similar. Sometimes different, just depends on the person or the community. So, my role as a board member for Working Heritage, so we are 22 historical buildings around CBD of Melbourne and also out. These are heritage buildings that uh, sometimes are not sponsored by the landowner, usually a, a government department. State. So they sort of look at the economics around the maintenance of the historical heritage building. Sometimes they don't have the capacity or the resourcing to, to enhance and protect that. So that's where our, our committee and the board um, look at heritage buildings and we look at our creating sustainable business model where, uh, like a, a in out building and that rent goes back into conservation. So we're like creating a, a socially diverse occupancy with our with our tenants. So we have um, uh, artists to uh, ballet companies, companies, IT companies, uh, historical buildings, diversity there, um, increasingly growing. So we get a lot of um, uh, you know, a, a phone call or a email you know, every couple of weeks. Local, don't want this building. Can you? Over. Got to come with some from. But we're looking at <coughs> now using our uh, historical buildings and having them sustained in terms of conservation, but having them used as well by by our uh, community. I think it's really important that that period of time, so if you look at the 18th and 19th century, 20th century, got these great uh, uh, 
beautiful brick buildings. Um, you look at the old mechanics and the old scout halls, old uh, founding shops, um, old cottages and homesteads. Uh, so they're an important part of our landscape and our history and our heritage. Part of that period of time, colonial period of establishing um, about our industries. Really important period of time that you know allows us our community to you know be a strong society today you look at Ballarat for an example all the historical buildings through here they've all been you know, repurposed and, and getting used by a diverse range of businesses I think that's really important to you know have our heritage our historical building you know integrated into you know a, a CBD area with your, you know, your Lego buildings that are getting constructed today which are very boring in their architectural sense but that's another workshop again so <laughs> um, you know how do you integrate and but how do you integrate you know, new buildings when you've got this beautiful historical landscape in Ballarat you know and not impacting you know that heritage from a, a visual perspective so mm. but yeah when you ask what what heritage is it, it is sub, it is subjective to the person um I just look at you know our indigenous landscapes. Um, you know our, our creation stories are heritage, and, and they're not physical. Um, you know, it's intangible. It's social. So, you know, where does that social? Uh, what does social heritage look like? And that's another workshop in itself. But um, yeah, the, the working heritage you know, incorporated. Um, it's it's a great space to be in, and, and looking at you know trying to protect that period of time. Mm. In, our, in our history. It's only one little period of time, but really important. And as you know, heritage under the uh, Heritage Act 95 is a rolling 50 year bubble. So, you know, if you're looking at anything you know, back from 50 years from today um, and, and beyond that, that's going to be in that heritage space uh, in the near future. Mm. So, All right, I might bring you in there. Aaron, but the others should feel free to jump in um, on this one. Whenever I think about heritage, I think about that famous Walter Benjamin quote about how there is no document of civilization that is not simultaneously a document of barbarism. And what he means by that, of course, is most of the buildings that we treasure as important heritage sites are buildings that were constructed by the rich and the privileged and were often constructed in circumstances where they were dependent on other people being in quite miserable situations. I mean, I think of those, um, you know, southern plantations that are such a big feature of, you know, the southern states in America, but beautiful houses, but of course they were dependent upon slavery. Does that matter? Can we still celebrate such buildings if they were documents of... <laughs> barbarism of privilege of oppression or do we need to change the way that we think about heritage when we, 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 we're talking about those kind of buildings? For me, the problem for me is around the definition of heritage. We are so far beyond, particularly in Ballarat, we are so far beyond the broader understanding of the word that we have we have narrowed that word to mean a particular type of building and, and, and streetscape. Um, but just quickly, I'll go back. Um, you mentioned Williams at the beginning, and we know that there's an extraordinary man who um, lived in Ballarat, and that was Mullawalla, and he had his name changed or uh, anglicised to English as William, correct me, William Wilson. Wilson. And that heritage is so incredibly important locally that we we have we struggle, Ballarat, don't we? We struggle with stuff. We struggle with is this the the best building that we can do? Is this do we, what do we need to protect? How do we how do we protect it? Yet at the same time, we deny the stories that, that come before the people who come before the places who come before. I'm not a historian. I will not remember dates, names, places, but I do remember how things make me feel. I do remember 
the times that I've felt. I feel lots of things. I think as artists we feel lots of things, hey. Um, but the issue I think for, for us is around those particular buildings, those, those buildings particularly in Ballarat, that were built by rich people but they were at that time philanthropists as well and they granted a lot of those buildings to the city. There's the statues up Sturt Street that there was a, a feeling and a sense of giving to the community but now we seem to put heritage and um, on a pedestal in a way that is about individualism. It's no longer about, about community and how, how, how do we as a people deal with those really important questions of, we talk a lot about ownership, we talk a lot about, um, I have a right to do this, I have a right to knock that building down and put up what I want. We, we live in a situation where developers are pre-creating how we're going to live in the future. At, at what point do we stop and say, hey, these are things that we need, that we really need to talk about? For me, heritage is about a much broader concept. It's about where we come from. It's not only about where we live. It's not only about our patch of dirt. It's about those stories that go beyond. Recently, there was a really interesting discussion around Lydiard Street. This conversation did not go far, and you'll, you'll know why once I tell you what it was about. The idea was that we would close Lydiard Street and um, because, you know, the beautiful buildings, and we'll put trees. We'll, we'll put trees through Lydiard Street, and wow, how amazing would that look? There was such opposition, just so big and so fast, about the whole concept of, of heritage that we can't do anything about that street. It's a film set, was oh. what some people said as well. It's a film set, so we can't destroy that because that may destroy work that we bring into the city. But the concept of actually, can you imagine, just for a moment, close your eyes, you're standing in Sturt Street, you look up and you see the beautiful Regent sign, iconic, cultural iconic of, you know, image of Ballarat, and there are huge gum trees all the way down the street. For me, it seemed extraordinarily beautiful, amazing that we would bring in the heritage of what was there. I think the problem for me with heritage is that when we, when we replicate it and we don't talk about those, those really important things. What's the other heritage of Ballarat? Child sexual abuse. Mm. Why don't we talk about this story? We don't talk about the the story of the indigenous people. We talk about it little bits and pieces, and you know we we pay our respects, but it's not a big story here. And the other the other things are things like our industrial our industrial heritage is amazing. Look at how did they build those creeks. Lord's sake, you can't even climb down them and they, they built them in those years. The railway gates, but, you know, but facadism just is something that, um, that I think is, is rife as well. I jumped all over the place there. I can only say in my defence that I'm, that I'm 14 months uh, free from public speaking, so I just have to get it all out at once. All right, Dennis, well... Let's turn to you. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in pursuing the question of heritage as it arises in a colonial society like Australia, because it seems particularly fraught. I mean, I remember reading an account of um, colonial Sydney that made the point that all of the early buildings of um, Sydney were constructed using limestone that was taken from the dispossession of Indigenous camps. The limestone had been accumulated from shell mines. And quite literally, the early landscape of Sydney was built upon this dispossession, physically built mm -hmm. upon it. How then does heritage play out in that context of uh, a colonial society where very often most of our most prominent um, historical sites are simultaneously crime scenes, if, if you like? I mean, I know um, Erin mentioned previously the, the controversy that 
emerged in, in, in Ballarat about in, uh, uh, renaming the suburbs after an Indigenous person. I know you've written about that. Maybe, oh, you, yeah, maybe you want to talk about that in a little bit? And, me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Wadawan, Wadawan as well and their present leaders and future leaders. Um, I became a bit involved with um, researching a, a man who we, we knew as King Billy and also was known as Will, William Wilson. And I was quite um, taken when one of the local Wadawaran um, members uh, approached the council with um, the, the, the possible name of Mullawalla, which was his Aboriginal name, um, for the new suburb. And I think we all thought what a great idea it was fitting in with government policy and council policy towards reconciliation. And we got a very big shock when the um, people living in that area designated to be a new suburb of 10,000 people, but still only like one to 2,000 people, they really rejected the name and were very angry about it enough to get organised, a group that probably wasn't organised at all before this event, and uh, to collect signatures. And uh, they were only allowed to object on three grounds with uh, it being similar to another name in the country and causing problems for emergency services and being difficult to say and spell. And anyway, I attended the council meeting and it, it appeared that Aboriginality or recognising the Indigenous past or a, a, a leader who was, whose death was celebrated in a very big way in 1896 um, just meant nothing to these people people and they um, were very angry and just rejected it. And because the council had a new democratic sort of um, process uh, that had to take more notice of the people who lived there than the other people in, in the town, um, they had to start again. And so in the end, the suburb was named uh, Winter Valley after the a very early successful f farmer, butcher farmer, gold, gold miner who made a very lot of money in that same area. So, it, it, to me, what I want to bring out from that um, discussion was that one of the women who rang me and was angry about my support for the name um, said that it didn't fit with the names in their suburb. And, and then I had to think, who d does the naming in our new developments? Well, it's the developers or it has been up until this point. And so they create names, and so they had these very Yorkdale and Kensington and um, were the names of the estates, and the streets in them were very uh, alluding to British royalty, basically, uh, or at least half a dozen of the main streets. And so you, you had this um, commercial development that had in a way set the scene for a certain type of suburb and that they felt that Mullawalla didn't fit it. Also, they had no interest, no knowledge, um, and just no, I suppose, respect for the um, local descendants who wanted to name name that name. Well, I feel so like... Let's be clear. It was 100 people objected. Hmm. 100 people out of a city of... I think they got a petition with 200 and... There, and evidently only two people who lived in the area put in submissions for the name. Mm. Uh, the people who put in submissions weren't living in that proposed area. I feel like it's a whole series of questions that we could tease out from that anecdote. But um, maybe just to pursue this train of thought, I can ask you all for your response to the controversy that's been happening all over the world in terms of heritage, and it's particularly for in a country like Australia, how do we respond when, for instance, there is a monument, a statue to somebody in a town square who is, say, associated? Where, where is that coming from? <laughs> oh, it's me. <laughs> No, it's not me. I don't know where it's coming from. Anyway, that's very annoying. What do we do if there is a monument, a statue to somebody in a city like Ballarat or Melbourne or Sydney or somewhere else who is associated with, say, Indigenous dispossession? Do we think the statue should be torn down? Should it be re... I'm not really for tearing down statues, okay, well, but so I, I am for um, 
explanatory plaques and, and modifications and leading people to have a rethink about it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. What about you guys? Do you, do you think there are cases where statues should be torn down? <laughs> uh, great question. <laughs> uh, so I go back, I was fortunate in my studies doing the undergrad in archaeology that uh, I was able to do some electives in anthropology. Mm -hmm. And so studying, although I enjoyed the art, uh, still had context, so although I enjoyed the archaeology, the study and understanding of Logical methodologies to understand cultures and people in society has helped me, uh, you know, uh, delve into history and respect that history and heritage as, as part of our timeline of humanity on Earth. And if I looked at, we've got you know, the statue of James Cook in, uh, in Melbourne. Then. Um, yes, that's a reminder of. Colonial trauma um, from an indigenous perspective, but then you've got another perspective as well, a heritage perspective, and that's the, you know, the Anglo Saxon heterodox demographic. I would say that the Anglo Saxon um, community, in, in terms of people talk about heritage, Captain James Cook's an important part of that history, and so. If I looked at landscapes and stratigraphy uh, and I looked at country, we've got these layers of heritage you know, that we walk across every day and we see and enjoy. Uh, to me, we've got to acknowledge that history um, and, and don't bury it uh, mm -hmm. in a way. So acknowledge that um, we do have a colonial history that brought trauma to the Australian communities that were already here, um, but then also I looked at I looked at other, as another community as well that that they're connected to you know, that that statue. So who am I to say to them you shouldn't have that when I'm wanting to have tolerance in our society for all heritage and, and be respectful for all of our history and heritage, um, population increase. And you know the the demand for you know, natural spaces for, for residential that's not going to go away. So you touched on so how does a developer um, when they come and look at a parcel of land that's got heritage on it? It might be an artifact in the ground, and there might be on top of it a an old historical chimney um, that's left standing with some great French bond brickwork on it. Great rollback and a beautiful flu, you know. So uh, that's important heritage as well that I don't think we should knock down. I think we should acknowledge that. But your statues are quite significant because they are reminders of you know, to the indigenous community of, of trauma and, and horrible um, mm. you know, events that happened. So, mm. but uh, if we don't respect and acknowledge our history, we're not moving forward as a society. So, you know. History <coughs> gives us a lot of answers when we delve back into history and, and watching how humans have made decisions in particular environments, um, how they've gone about their work, uh, what technology they had at their uh, deployment. Um, so I think that's been important to acknowledge. Um, how is a brick veneer house going to look in a hundred years? It's going to be a heritage building. You know, very boring brick lane. <laughs> Where Aaron, can oh, but, oh, yeah, I'm just saying, well, statues are important, um, part of our history. Uh, yes, it'd be great to you know, knock down James Cook from a subjective perspective, but you know, if we're wanting tolerance and we're wanting to work as a community in harmony, we need to respect everyone's heritage. Aaron, can I get your perspective on that? That you were talking before about you know Ballarat not acknowledging. The, the heritage of, say, child sexual abuse, what would be your response if there were, for instance, a statue to some archbishop or Catholic oh. priest or whatever who would be associated with that? Should it remain there? There is. There is. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I just blundered into that one, didn't I? 
and it's not a statue, it's a building, but, you know, the, the developers actually have done a good job there because they've, they've crowded it in with lots of other houses, so it's hard to see. But I just think you'll be way too polite, way <laughs> too polite. I think that statues are important not only because of who they honour, but where they are. And where they are is really prominent places, mm. they're public places that people walk past every day, may not necessarily read an internal print form, say, oh, actually, I was going to swear then, <laughs> um, actually this guy's not a good guy, mm. you know. Um, they're in Berlin, a museum in Berlin found a really great way of dealing with a lot of the statues around um, Nazis. And what they did was remove those statues. They didn't, they didn't pull them down. They didn't treat them disrespectfully. But they took them from the prominent place where they were and they put them all in a basement of this museum so that people weren't re-traumatised by seeing them so, so often and in public, really prominent places. Mm. But if you wanted to see those, you could still go and see those. Well, they are. Artworks too, aren't they? Mm. They have been sculpted by some artists. And John Batman's been moved, isn't he? Yes, I mean, there's a, the statues get moved um, all of the time. Brings me to another question, though. Maybe I'll direct this one to, to, to you, Janice, although I'd be interested in, in all three of your perspectives, because it seems to me that the questions about heritage aren't simply to do with what's decided, they're also to do with who does the deciding. And this maybe comes back to the you know the story about the the suburb in Ballarat who should be making these decisions because it doesn't seem to be so anomalous to have a situation where in fact the local community doesn't particularly see a building from the past as being particularly worth preserving wants to have a modern up to date suburb and it's Ex and ex it's external experts who say, in fact, this building has a historical association or has an architectural feature that needs to be preserved. Who should be making these decisions? How do we do it in a way that is democratic and inclusive, but also takes into account specialist knowledge? I'm not really well up on the processes. There are heritage committees and so forth, and they're probably only middle-class people in them. And I am aware that the other people I work with, the caravan park dwellers, wouldn't be the sort of people who would have any say over any heritage um, saving or anything. Which, which is a problem, surely. Yes. And I, we were talking a little bit before about what people value about their, their past or what heritage they'd like kept. And from my discussions with the permanent residents and caravan parks, it didn't, I didn't ask them specifically, but their, their sentimental attachments seemed to be more with, more with environmental features, like somewhere where they could see hills like they used to see when they were growing up, or a mountain, or trees, or a, a lake. Mm. Um, so it was an environment. And on that definition of heritage, I have to keep reminding myself that it's not big houses like Como. It, it's oral history, cultural heritage, it's indigenous heritage, it's natural heritage, so we know what the bush may have looked like a long time ago and things like that. And we sometimes forget that, don't we? Totally. But, but how do we get everyone involved? Hmm. I'm part of a group called Ballarat East Network hmm. and it's activism around supporting the concept of neighbourhood character. Hmm which is also heritage, absolutely. We had, um, there's a lot of development going on out in Ballarat East, or at least there was, a lot of it's gone to the under, other end of town, but what, um, what the locals wanted to do was make sure that there was a, a good mix of housing, but also great, um, you know, keep the trees, turn housing to look towards the creek instead of away from the creek, mm. things, things of, of that nature. Ballarat East is very much a chaotic suburb because it was um, settled before it was surveyed. People just set up camp wherever they wanted. Um, but whereas when we go over Yarralee Creek to up <coughs> towards what was called Ballarat West, it's all very, you know, um, lockstep. Um, yeah, kind of grid. And I say that because someone came out and did a, um, a report on a development in Ballarat East 
and uh, returned to council. I'm not having a go at this guy. It's what it's what he knew at the time of of what this term neighbourhood character meant. And his his report, which is sense for locals, was uh, Ballarat East has no discernible char- neighbourhood character. Jeez. <laughs> I said, excuse me, what are you talking about? And I think that was really about uh, local government doing their best with what they had, but if we continue to do things the same way, we're going to get the same result every single time. And what Luxville is is about is about encouraging really bold leadership. Go where we haven't been before. How do we know what it's like until we get there? And we've got to really be able to champion those people and accept contradictions and and controversy and fight it out. We're all adults here. We can have really strong, hard decisions. We can accept what the judge says. That's fine. But let's really talk up because the whole Moa Walla thing <coughs> came about as a result of complacency. I think a lot of people thought, what a great idea. No, no, I won't put in a, a, yes. um, a favourable comment on that because and yeah, it's going to happen. We're, we're all good here, but but it didn't. Mm. Mm. All right, well, extending on that, and again, this is a question to all three of you. How do we celebrate and preserve the heritage of those who didn't live in those grand Houses, the people who lived in, you know, the cheap disposable cottages that don't have an obvious um, architectural value and, in fact, in many ways may well, may not have been preserved. Can you think of examples where heritage has been extended to, you know, the little people, the people who weren't in the, in, in the estates? The, the ordinary people who were kept out of those estates. Are there good ways to do that kind of heritage? I mean, do any examples come to mind? Well, occasionally um, you've had legislation to stop people building big um, houses near the coast where there have been beach shacks, but unfortunately that's only very rarely. Um, and my little beef is about a lot of the little holiday shop shacks around in the bush and Dandenong and so forth, and by lakes and on the sea, were part of an era where <coughs> Australians' workers could afford a little holiday, even if their building was made out of kerosene, flattened kerosene tins. <laughs> and um, I, I wouldn't like that history to go, but I know that now we seem to get a gentrification of all the leisure places as well, and that that these um, little shacks around the lakes are being replaced by massive houses and the same along the coastline. Um, And so we've lost that. We may lose that social memory of what it was like when working people from Lilydale went to Rosebud and camped on the beach and so forth uh, in the tea tree. And um, I know that there are mountain hut preservation societies and, and there's in... On the Mount Dandenong, you can't build a bigger house. You can only renovate the little place you've got. Mm. Um, that's because of bushfire risk, I think. But um, there are some legislative things in, in place. But to me, it just seems like um, the, the wealthy with big houses in the city are just getting big houses in all those other places as well. Yeah. For me, the concept of, of heritage, when we talk about buildings, I. It just, it just really feels like we, we just miss an opportunity to talk about heritage mm-hmm. in a cultural sense. Yeah, and there's a, there actually is a really great example in Ballarat East and this was supported by the local council and it's, it's a really terrific example of using artists to interpret and work with communities uh, and that would be down at uh, Pennyweight Park Forrest Kegel is the artist down there and I, and I mm. can't remember the other guy's name. But what they did was work with the community and uh, did research on the area, developed sculpt- sculptures that reflected the, the life, um, animal and wildlife that would have been there, you know, many years ago with these crazy creatures that children had drawn. 
So it was, it pulled them all together and the, the park itself now is, is absolutely gorgeous and it in some ways educates the kids as well about, about what is there. So I, I think if we can embrace the concept of heritage in a, in a more cultural sense, then we have the capacity to, to educate future generations about not only what was there but what mark you will leave. What, what will you do? What will your legacy be? How will that be interpreted in the future? And they're, they're conversations that, that mm. are really important to have. It doesn't have to be a building, though, does it? It's oral history and mm. so you don't have to. Well, yes. I mean, that, that brings me to another question that I wanted to ask to all three of you before probably we go to questions, which is the obvious but fraught relationship between heritage strategies and gentrification. So last weekend I was in Bendigo for the Bendigo Writers Festival and it was lovely. It was up near the art gallery. There are beautiful buildings there. But it was very apparent that the people who were coming to this part of town were the visitors from out of town. <laughs> and most people in Bendigo lived quite far away from it. It had nothing to do with it. How then do we prevent this from taking place? Because it very often seems like a program for heritage is kind of the vanguard for the gentrification of a neighbourhood and the driving out of the people whose heritage is being celebrated. How do we break that nexus? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Let me say that trying to think about the answer. So um, there's a there's a lot in that and then even in the past previous question. Um, even touching on the smaller voice and uh, you know, your workers and how their voice and heritage looks like. Uh, <clears throat> more broadly you've got the uh, local government planning scheme that makes decisions. Uh, Ward councillors don't make decisions. They only make decisions on informed information. Um, so it all, to me it all comes down to the local government planning scheme in that space and that's that recognition of heritage and voice. Uh, you've got state legislation, so two acts of parliament, the, the Heritage Act and the Aboriginal Heritage Act and the planning scheme. So there's three mechanisms that, that make determinations. Um, I think <coughs> neighbourhood character studies need to, um, that's a key document, a neighbourhood character study can uh, be enhanced a bit more um, because that's people's voice. So if you were to go and consult with the fellow City of Ballarat goes to consult the community about a heritage space um, that should be picked up. And they say, here's a, here's a neighborhood character study or a landscape study with all those themes in it. What do you reckon? What's your, what's your feelings? What's your uh, perception? How do you feel about this place? What are your thoughts? And that gets into the neighborhood character study that goes and informs the strategic master planning of East Ballarat, mostly. Mm. So it encapsulates all voices in there with people who are feel comfortable to put that voice forward. So from a more broader controlling perspective, or trying to get more voice in there about what people's passions are and what they feel for country, <coughs> um, can come through that planning document, because then that eventually informs planning scheme. So uh, flip it the other way around, if you were to rezone primary industry, primary use into residential zone one or two or uh, commercial zone or industrial zone, it's great to um, understand what's happening in that landscape before it gets rezoned into a development zone of some, some context. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I hope that answers one little broad question. Um, the other one is, uh, I'll take an example of the Briars Homestead in Mount Martha on the Mornington Peninsula. That was built in the 18, 1842. Uh, Alexander and Emma Galvin 
uh, that have the first preemptive rights to that property, uh, 648 their lease. Um, they employed particular leave men from the uh, New South Wales colony to come down and, and build their um, their homestead and their farm buildings. And those uh, tradespeople that, that lived on site, they've got a great story to tell. And there's a, a, a builder's hut there that um, can be uh, investigated and researched a bit more to find out what the builders were up to back in that time because they could essentially built this beautiful homestead, although Alexander and uh, Emma were, were quite wealthy, uh, elite in that in that um, space there. It was the builders that built this beautiful uh, homestead and, and the outbuildings and the farm buildings. And they remained on site, they lived on site, and the same with the uh, workers. All the workers lived on site, they had a, a female and male quarters. There's a lot of voice in there to be identified, a lot of seen what they're up to in terms of their daily consumption and their activities, their daily activities. So um, archaeology and history, historical research and, and anthropological research can really uh, delve into those smaller stories, those smaller narratives on country that are heritage. Um, I think they're important because they built that colonial period of what the, yes, it was the wealthy elite that had the fund those historical buildings, but it was those people that had the blisters on their hands and the calluses mm. that really built that heritage. Mm. You know, there's still that voice to be heard there. Um, you had the uh, Blood Brothers up in the uh, New South Wales colony. They were the first uh, you know, private brick-making company. They were here for seven years as convicts. Um, they were already bricklayers. And then once they get their ticket to leave part, they set up their own brick making company and the one probably the most successful brick making company of that time. So mm -hmm. how does their voice get heard in, in our in our heritage? All right, I think we might be just about on time um, there. I was gonna to try to get in um, a fantastic quote from Goethe. Oh fuck it, I'll get it anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I think really kind of sums up the way one way that we might think about heritage, Goethe writes, what you have as heritage, take now as task, for thus you will make it your own. And what I think he means is that we need to make heritage something that we don't simply venerate, but needs to actually guide how we might live in the future. And that's something to kind of think about. Thank you so much for coming out on this cold, blustery Ballarat. <laughs> 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 for, for this discussion it's um it's been great it's been and your discussion your questions have been fantastic can you please join me in thanking our three panelists adam mcginnis janice newton and erin mccuskey